Hey guys, what's up? Thank you so much for tuning in today here at Elevate Church. We know that today's message is going to rock your world and elevate your life to the next level. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the message. Stand to your feet real quick. Let's do a profession of faith. As we're in this message of stretch, I want us to really think about this. As you say this, I want you to believe it. I know it's hard for some of us at first, but I pray that as we continue to profess this, we're going to get this down. Let's all say this at the count of three. Ready? One, two, three. I love God's word. I believe God's word. I am what it says I am. I can do what it says I can do. I have ears ready to hear. Therefore, my faith is growing today. In Jesus' name, amen. Awesome. All right. Be seated. Give two people a high five while you're sitting down. So here's the deal. You know, we've been on this series that we just kicked off last Sunday. How many still have the rubber band? Okay. It's a great reminder. I had a message already prepared and planned for us today, but in the wake of 29 murders and the things that we're facing in our nation, I just felt like, you know what, we have to shift here a little bit. The message still applies because how many know that in the midst of something that is so tragic, we need to literally step up our faith as a church. The church has to have a voice. The church can no longer be silent. The church can no longer be quiet. Christians can no longer just sit there and watch and let people complain about everything that's happening. And then we just go ahead and we literally just, we cowered back sometimes. And that's the truth. I got to talk the truth today about how we need to not only faith forward, but have the courage to move forward with the things that God is calling us to do, not only individually, but corporately as the church. Amen? Amen. And so today you live in a world that constantly, especially in America, that says defeat, defeat, defeat. You look at our government, defeat. You look at our politics, defeat. You look at abortion, defeat. You look at everything that we're facing, the election, defeat. The problem that we have is that we see defeat, defeat, defeat. And if not careful, you and I can start taking on the spirit of this world where you're disappointed. You're walking and living defeated. You're living in fear. And I'm not trying to speak this over your life. I'm just telling you what defeat does. And I'm sure every single one of us have lived in a moment in our life where we feel like we're defeated. Our family's defeated. Our finances is defeated. Our government is defeated. Our health is being defeated. But how many know that if you're not careful, you can allow that spirit of defeat to literally taint your soul? Like there's so much argument right now with all this defeat that we're seeing, especially in politics, that people begin to start arguing and whether they're left wing or right wing. You know what? At the end of the day, honestly, who cares? It doesn't matter. What matters is I'm not letting that taint my soul. Now, I'm not saying that that government doesn't matter. I'm not saying that picking the right president doesn't matter. Don't leave here saying like, wow, there's that faith preaching. They don't care. No, I'm saying... Use your faith to have a voice, right? Go out and vote. Do all the things you got to do. But it's it's a problem when when now your soul is so tainted and so so disruptive and so distracted and 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 it's it's the spirit is just so negative that it literally messes you up. Do you honestly think that God is in heaven worried or stressed out about what's happening in our world, our economy, our government? No, God's not worried. So if God's not worried, why should we be worried? We got to put our faith. We got to put our face back at the one and set our gaze on Jesus. He's still king of kings, Lord of lords. At the end of the day, when all this is said and done, God is still God. When all the dust settle, God still remains. Earth is short, heaven is long. Are you hearing me today? And and we have to talk real today. And, and, you know, sitting this morning at 3 a.m., I I went to my news, and I always read the news in the morning, and and I saw 1 a.m., Ohio, Dayton, Ohio, and I'm just like, here we go again. And, and, and it's easy just to kind of just move on with life because it's easy to get numb with this, isn't it? It's easy to be like, okay, great, another mass shooting, all right, it happened. And we just kind of move on. We're not supposed to just move on. We should mourn as the church, okay? We should hurt as a church. We should hurt as people for hurting people. And I know that it's so easy to look at what's happening in our world and begin to take on the eyes 
of what people see and they see defeat. They see defeat. We see defeat sometimes. But how many know that even God himself had a son on the cross named Jesus? And what looked defeated, when everybody saw, man, our Savior has been defeated. On the third day, man, let me tell you something. He came out of that grave with great victory. And so that should tell us something, that God's not afraid of defeat. God already has victory for every single one of us. But that victory comes by faith. It comes by faith. There is no other way. Right now, maybe you came in with anxiety today. Maybe you're dealing with depression. Maybe you're sad. Maybe you're unhappy. Let me tell you something. The only way to get up in a down world is faith. There's no other way. You can read as many books as you want. You can listen to as many podcasts as you want. You can listen to any guru, whatever it is that you listen to. And let me tell you something. That's temporary. But faith is eternal. God has something so much more for us, but we have to wake up and realize that, man, we are living in a broken world. Last week I said, faith is like a rubber band. How many remember that? How many were here last Sunday? Did you guys enjoy that last Sunday? Yes. Okay, good. Um, so faith is like a rubber band, kind of like life is like a box of chocolates, right? <laughs> and so the rubber band was created to stretch. Well, guess what? Your faith is like a rubber band. Your faith was created by God to stretch. Your faith was never meant to just live at a minimal state. Your faith was created to constantly stretch and believe God and trust God and, and, and set your eyes on God. No matter what you're facing or going through, it is meant to stretch. If you're going to step into a new season, you got to stretch. If you're going to step into a new purpose with God, you're going to have to stretch. If you want to start a new business, if you want to go buy a house in this economy, if you want to go buy a, 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 a car, I mean, you literally sometimes got to just stretch your faith and believe God that God is going to provide. Think about this. Okay, there's, there's, there's 5,000 men, and, and, and Jesus looks at his disciples, and he said, feed them. That was a stretch. They're like, uh, we got nothing. And, and Jesus said, no, but what do you have? Now, mind you, that was only 5,000 men, but total numbers like 14,000 with women and children. And all they did was they brought the fishes and the loaves. And you know what God did with that? You know what Jesus did with that? He stretched it up to heaven, and he began to pray to the Father, and he said, Father, bless it. And he multiplied what Jesus stretched. But it took some disciples to go look around and see, what do we have? Everybody say, stretch. Yes. God is trying to teach us that when there is scarcity, when there is lack, when there is limitation, you and I have to stretch because when you put that vision, that dream, when you put your trust in the hands of God, in the hands of Jesus, he will bless it and he'll multiply it. But it starts with faith. Faith in the impossible. Faith is like a rubber band. It was created to stretch. Are you guys here today? Okay, let's go to two verses real quick. 2 Corinthians 4, 17, 18. You got to have a response for hurting people, guys. You can't just get caught up in their mourning. We mourn, but on the third day, we're up. There's resurrection life again. Okay, let's look at what the scriptures say. <clears throat> It says, for our present troubles are small. They're big in our eyes when we're facing something, but they're small to God. It says they're small and won't last very long. Aren't you glad that our problem is temporary? Yet they produce for us glory vastly, overweighs them, and will last forever. I love that. When I read them, I'm like, man, whatever it is that I'm going through, whatever it is that you're facing, whatever challenge you're struggling with right now, whether it's internal issues or whether it's external stuff that's happening i'm so glad that it's not forever it's just temporary the, the the what makes it feel forever is when you wake up every single day and you think about what you don't have who you're not you know how much money you don't when you just start thinking just negative after negative of course it feels like an eternity but to god god's like that's small potatoes that's small for me but guess what? And what you're experiencing, God's saying, I'm going to use that to produce something greater that's going to bring me glory. Because what you couldn't do, God's saying, I'm going to do for you. I'm going to help you. And he goes on to say, and, it, oh, and I love this, and it outweighs them all. And it will last forever. So 
So look at this. So we don't look at the troubles we can see right now. We don't look at the troubles we can see. And how many know that we are seeing a lot of trouble on this earth? Man, we're seeing a lot of trouble right here in California, in our country, in our nation. We're seeing a lot of trouble. He says, rather fix our gaze on things that cannot be seen. For the things we see now will soon be gone. But the things we cannot see will last forever. Well, let's take that a step further. Let's look at the next verse, 2 Corinthians 5, 7. He says, for we walk by what? Not by what? Every day, every single one of you need to wake up and determine what you're going to live by. Every day. You have to wake up and make a self-determination that today I have to do what God says for me to do. Okay, Here, here's, here's what Jude says. It says, the just shall live by faith. It, it didn't say the just shall feel by faith. It didn't say the just shall see by faith. He says, and the just shall live by faith, but we walk by faith and not by sight. And I'm so glad that we serve a God who is a walking water God. How, aren't, you, aren't you glad that we have a God who knows how to walk on water? And he gives permission to those that want to step out and stretch. You, look, you remember the story of Peter last week? Man, that brother, he stretched. He said, okay, bid me to come. Jesus said, okay, come. And he went, he didn't listen. It's not that he walked on water. It's that he walked on a word from Jesus. He heard come and he didn't step on that water. He stepped on come. And it was every step on that word come that he just kept stepping on that word and stepping on that word. But the moment he, he took his gaze off of the Lord, what, what happened to him? He sunk like so many of us. You know, we start off something. We get excited. God gives you a dream. Yay! You start living the dream. Ah! That's just the way it is. And so every day you need to wake up and you got to determine what you're going to live by. I will walk by faith. Not by what I see. Let's look at another verse. Look at Matthew 4, 4. He said, but he answered, this is Jesus saying, and said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every what? Listen, I know this is simple teaching, but it's, it's the simple things that we don't do. We complicate it. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every what? Word. By every word that proceeds out of the mouth of Almighty God. We have to learn how to start taking the scripture that breathes life to dead things, and we have to start taking that at face value. We can't keep treating it like, okay, well, it's the word. It's the Bible. No, it's not just any book. You can read any book in this world, and let me tell you something. You get bored. You read it once, there's nothing else to get out of it. You read God's word, let me tell you something. You get something fresh out of it every single time. You can read one verse, and you'll get like a million things out of that one verse. Why? It's life. And God's saying, I want you to live off that word. I want you to live off the words of life, the words of healing, the words of victory, the words of breakthrough. But we have to stand on that word. we got to believe that word. Faith comes by what we are hearing, not what we are seeing. Faith comes by what we are hearing, not what we are seeing. And we keep seeing some pretty gnarly stuff in our personal life, in the world and everywhere we, we see hurt and pain. But at the end of the day, what are you hearing? What are you hearing God say? That's how we have to live up in a down world. Because this world is, man, it's so, it just sucks the life out of you. You just turn on the news. I'm a news buff, man. Don't watch news. If, you're, if, you're, if, you, if you get weak, like, don't watch it. I like reality. Like for me, it's like I, I like facing my realities. I'm like, okay, man. Man, we're messed up. Okay, now what? Now what are we going to do? Am I just going to sit here and just look at our news and, and look at our broken world and, and, and just let everybody do this? Let me tell you something. When you're all, always constantly hearing bad news, you have to come back. When people are just bad news, bad news, bad news you have to have a different spirit about you. Like you got to come back. Like, like you're either going to react with fear, just like everybody else, or you're going to respond with faith. And when people start hearing you respond with faith, get ready for the attack. Because when you start talking, listen, it is a crime today to live by faith. Now I'm going to show you in scripture. I'm going to prove it to you. Because if it was a crime for Jesus, it's a crime for you. 
I promise you, the moment you start speaking like, okay, what are you going through? Man, here, God's going to, and you just start speaking life over there. People are like, you insensitive Christian jerk you. You hear that? But, but, but God is, God, God, has, God has different news. It's called good news. You know, when, when people are, are looking at you, you say, you know what? I gather my news from a different source, man. You know, where I gather my news, it's a whole other dimension. It's called the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. But see, it takes faith to live like that. And if you don't think like that, then you need to renew the way you think. Because God is at a whole other dimension. Yes, we live in this world, but we're not of it. And we often forget. We think like, I'm going to live here forever. No, you're not. Our life is short. Heaven is forever. It's eternity. And we live this life that's so short. And most of this life, if you think about it, uh, I'm not going to do the math, but if you think about everything you do, sleeping, eating, you know, um, entertainment, uh, uh, exercise, all the things that we do as activities, if you do the math, okay, 50% of our life goes into that. 50. That means the other 50%, we waste it with worry, stress, anxiety, depression. That isn't equal. So you have to just wonder, like, man, this life is short. I got to go ahead and I got to faith up. I got to stop letting the spirit of this world just literally bring me down where I'm always living. One moment I'm happy, the next moment I'm sad. One moment I'm victorious, the next moment I'm depressed. Like, that is not the way God is calling us to live. That's why God says, and the just shall live by faith. You shall walk by faith, not by sight. Why? Because what you see will tell you you're defeated. It's a quiet Catholic church today. I hope you're learning. What we hear should be greater than what we see. Right now, what I'm hearing is, Man, God, God, God has some, some love. God has some, some deliverance. God has some freedom for us. What we see says the opposite. What we see says, man, we're going down. Faith is believing God. Faith is being willing to walk, okay, off the grid map. It's, it's, it's willing to accept the fact that I may not have all the directions I need to get to destiny. Think about Abraham. God promised Abraham something very special. He told him that he would be the father of faith. Okay? And then he says to him, now go into the promised land. And the Bible says that Abraham went and did not know where he was going. You know what we do today? We're, we, want, we want God to give us all the answers to all the questions. We want God to draw out the map for us, how it's going to look like. Right? We start thinking like this. Like, God, just show me a sign. And, I'll, and I'll, I'll believe it. Now, nothing wrong with signs, because I believe that God does show signs. But if you're living on signs, you ain't living faith. Just like miracles. If you're someone that's only living for a miracle, then you're just expecting God to do everything for you, and you're just going to sit back and do nothing. Miracles is something that only God does when your faith can't do anything about it anymore. Faith is what I'm supposed to live by, and faith is what's supposed to give me that victory, that breakthrough. Faith in God's word is what's supposed to sustain me when I'm going through stuff, not always praying for a miracle. Miracles are special. Miracles is when God has to intervene when nothing else can be done. But we don't live by miracles. He said you live by faith. Are you hearing me today? Because there's so much doctrine out there that's just so twisted. That everything's a miracle. Everything, miracle, miracle, miracle. I'm like, okay, that's awesome. How about faith? You know? How about instead of just letting God do it? It's like you as a parent. Can you imagine if I did everything for Alexis? Which I want to do everything for you, baby. I can't do it. She's my daughter. I love her. But, man, the girl's got to grow up. Can't be there all the time. I want to. <laughs> but I can't. I got to believe that I put enough wisdom. I've put enough faith, invested enough time inside of her life that now she can make a decision in this life. She can wake up and make a decision to live by faith as well. That's what God the Father does for you and I. 
He says, I gave you a mustard seed of faith. Now go. Move mountains. Right? He didn't say talk mountain. We got that all confused. You know what? A lot of, the reason a lot of people don't speak in tongues is because they speak mountain. You guys still here? That's a good one, huh? Write that down. Write that down. Listen, faith will get you up, but faith will call you to stretch. I'm telling you right now. Uh, I said this last weekend. The idea of faith is not the value, guys. The value is the stretch. Because you can be saying like, man, I like this message. Wow, that's really great. That's good. That's, I'm, I'm giving you an idea. But that idea needs to go into action. It doesn't just happen. We have to go ahead and start stretching. This, this rubber band was never created to be on someone's wristband, on someone's wrist. It's not a wristband. It was created to hold papers together, right? It's created to stretch. And that's, you weren't created just to sit down. And just taking all word all day long. Praise the Lord. Yeah, give me more. Just, and then we're just spiritually obese. No, God called us to exercise our faith. He called us to put the faith into action. To do something with it. Not just let it be at its minimal state. It must, God, God, God wants you to be at your maximum potential, but you have to stretch. And watch out because the moment you even start thinking about moving into stretch faith, haters going to hate. Let's look at now Jesus because I told you I would, I would share this with you. So I want to say this very clearly. So faith isn't denying your circumstances, okay? Don't get this out of this message because that's not what I'm saying. But faith is what gives me the courage to face them. Right? Faith gives me the courage to face every single challenge I have. And I'm telling you, it's amazing. Look at this. Matthew chapter 12, verse 14. And you don't want to be shut down in your faith because of what people think of you. Matthew 12. Going on from that place, Jesus went into their synagogue. Look, he went into the church. Hey, listen, church people can shut down your faith. You see it all the time. All the time. Christians. I'm glad that Jesus put this one. So Jesus went into their church. And a man with a weak and twisted hand was there. In other words, the original version says there was a man that had a withered hand. In other words, man, his hand was completely deformed. There was nothing there. And the Pharisees were trying to accuse Jesus of a crime. Look at that. A crime. A crime of faith. And he says, so they asked him, does the law allow us to heal on the Sabbath day? And he said to them, what if one of your sheep falls into the pit on the Sabbath day? Won't you take hold of it and lift it out? A person is worth more than sheep. So the law allows us to do good on the Sabbath day. The law allows us to do good. Come on. God allows us to do good on a very bad day. Look at this. And he says, verse 13, Then Jesus said to the man, Stretch out your hand. Watch this. He told the man to what? Stretch. So check this out. He asked him to stretch out something he didn't have. Faith, listen, faith is what you're hearing, not seeing. He didn't go off of what he could see. He went off of what the Lord said. The Lord said, stretch out your hand. Uh, let's not forget the previous scripture, previous verse. He had no hand. It was withered. So he was able to hear and not see. And he heard the word stretch, and so he stretched out his hand, and bam, there was the miracle, right? And so he stretched it out, and it had been made as good as new. It was just as good as the other hand. But the Pharisees went out and planned how to kill Jesus. This man with the withered hand, listen, he heard the voice of the Lord, stretch. 
stretch. You know what? I appreciate and respect doctors. I really do. You know, our doctors are our friends. We know them. Okay, they're good people. I respect medicine. Medicine does a lot of good stuff. I needed to take medicine when I was really sick. So I have respect for that stuff. But let me tell you something. When, when you're facing something that's impossible, I, can, I wish I can take you all into like this crystal ball and show you all the times that I have walked into different hospitals where I've had doctors yell at me, nurses, staff, family members. I've had doctors laugh at me. I mean, I, can, I wish you can just see it. If you can just see it, like walking in, coming in with faith. And, and the reason that, that they've been angry is because this is the thought process, not only for some people, not all, because not all doctors are like that. There's a lot of great Christian doctors out there. But even family members would look at me with this despise, this, this anger, this hate, almost like what I'm about to do is a crime. Uh, let, let, me, let me explain it this way. This is what people think. How dare you? come into this hospital room and bring this family false hope that their loved one who is brain dead, who has been given like hours to live or days to live, and that you would be so insensitive to come to this place and bring them any form of hope after the facts have already been given let me tell you something. I'll tell you what's insensitive. What's insensitive is someone who's a believer of Jesus Christ, a follower of Jesus Christ, and that you would shrink back because of what people think about you, whether they laugh at you, whether they agree with you or not. Let me tell you something. The facts are the facts, but God's word will always overcome every fact. And you got to come to the place where I'm not ashamed of my faith. The pressure is not on me. I said this last week. The pressure is on God. You got to show up. I'm not the miracle worker. I'm just the vessel in which God wants to drive me through Bring me to the hospital as I show up. That's my work part. I got to drive there. I got to walk in there. I got to look like a fool for a little bit. I got to have people laugh at me for a little bit. But at the end of the day, my job is just to be the obedient one to show up and let God do the rest. But isn't that the problem with so many of us? Is that we start letting even coworkers, like some of us are embarrassed to pray for our food. I've been in restaurants with people. I love you. But it's true. I'm going to say it. You say it, some of you. And y'all don't, let me tell you something. When I pray for our food, I always look up to see who's in and who's not. And I'll be like, okay, let's pray, Father, thank you. And I'll look up like that, and they're like. <laughs> like, are you looking out for us? <laughs> what are you doing, man? <laughs> there ain't going to be a drive-by here, is there? <laughs> now, it could just be that, you know what, they're afraid to close their eyes. I don't know. But I'm saying this. Like, why are we afraid to pray for people? Oh, but you don't know who they are. I don't give a rip who they are. Oh, but you don't, you don't know. They're, they're very influential. All the more. Let's pray. And I know someone greater than their title. Come on. We have the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning. And the, are you kidding me? I'm going to be nervous because of who you are. Are you hearing me? That, but, but, but we shrink back, don't we? That's what they were trying. They were trying to shut Jesus down. Well, there, what, do you, what do you mean you're going to go ahead and heal on the Sabbath? See, and that's what the world will do. It will lay the law down, and eventually there will be a law that you can't operate in faith. That time's going to come. It's going to come. Oh, you're, why are you speaking death? Uh, no, I'm speaking what the Bible says. Read your Bible. There's going to be some times of some serious trials of testing of your faith, but that will produce the greatest patience, the greatest victory, the greatest character. Come on, you'll be able to withstand every single fury dart that's thrown at you, but you're not going to do it alone. You're going to have to get a faith lift. Yeah, I know some of us need a face lift, praise God. Huh, man? Well, let me tell you, faith will give you a face lift. It'll, cho it'll change your sadness and your sorrow to joy. Come on, you want a real face lift? Get a fake lift up. 
Faith will lift you up. Man, when you're feeling so down, when you're feeling defeated, faith will get you out of bed. Faith will allow you to hear the Spirit of God. Faith will trump what you're seeing in the natural. Faith will tell you you're going to make it. It's all going to be all right. But you got to put your faith in Christ. It's not like, I'm great. No. No. No, you got to wake up and you got to start quoting the word of God. The word of God is what is the word of life. You start saying things like this. I am the head, not the tail. I am above and not beneath. Why do you have to say that? Because if God said it, then he has to hold up his bargain of the word. The pressure's on him. Now, okay, God, I'm saying it. Now, you better start doing it, right? And you may not believe it at first. At first, you may be saying, like, I'm the head, not the tail, and you want to go back and lay down again. (laughs) Then you know what? I don't care if you're laying down, crying, boogers coming out. You just keep crying. "Uh, I'm the head, not the tail. You just keep saying it because there's going to come an hour. Where, man, all of a sudden you will rise again. Come on, you will step up again. You will trust again. You will believe again. And then you'll start seeing the victory of God. But until then, you got to faith up. You got to stretch. Slap yourself. Go ahead. Yeah, I tell you, it's, it's, this faith walk has not been easy. Everything we do at this church is such a, it's such a faith. It's a stretch. Look at Romans 10, 17. It says, so faith comes from what? That is hearing the what? The good news about who? Christ. That's the good news right there. Faith comes by hearing and by hearing. The perfect example example of this is the woman with the issue of blood. She wasn't a part of Jesus' disciples. She just heard. She heard about all the miracles this Jesus was doing. He's now coming across her town. Mind you, she's got 12 years of a flow of blood. 12 years, an issue, a challenge. I don't know what issue you have or how many years you've been dealing with your issue. You may have the issue of your negative. The issue of you doubt all the time. The issue of anxiety, the issue of depression, the issue of I'm not good enough, the issue of I don't believe God has chosen me or called me or touched me or whatever. Like all of us have an issue. Every single person in this room right now, you have an issue. And so this woman, she heard about this guy named Jesus who heals. And you know what she said? If you read your Bible, it says, she said to herself, if only I stretch out and touch the hem of his garment, I shall be made well. Now think about it. She didn't didn't receive her faith I mean, her healing by what she saw, because he wasn't doing nothing for her. She received her healing by what she heard. She heard about healing. She heard about God's uh, redemption. She heard of God's mercy. She heard of God's forgiveness. And you know then what she did? She decided, then I better stretch my hand in there. And you know what she did? She threw a stretch in there. She touched the hem of his garment. And then Jesus felt power come out of him. And he said, who touched me? Who, who, who was? And, and the disciples were like, man, we're, we're in the middle of, I mean, just think about the massive crowds that were just like, just trying to get up on Jesus. There were other people touching Jesus. And the disciples said, everyone's touching you. What are you talking about? He said, no, 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 no. There's their touch, and then there's faith touch. He's like, he's like, because faith touched me, and power came out of me. And he said, who touched me? And the girl was like, he said, girl, your faith has made you well. See, faith comes by what? Hearing. And what? And hearing by the word of of God. She heard the word on the street and she said, man, I am done with the tissues for my issues and I'm going to touch the hem of his garment and she was made well. Amen. Give the Lord a big hand clap for that. You know, when you read the Bible, you think you're, you know, you think like it's impossible for for me to ever be like these disciples or these Men and women of God in the Bible. You ever read the Bible like that? Like, man, I can, can never be like that. You know, Moses, David, Elijah. Like, they were, they were in some pretty gnarly situations. But, you know, we all, when we preach, we preach the stories of the victory. All right, well, let me teach you and tell you about the stories of man defeat. Okay, let's just take David. 
you know, Fabi, David was, was like, he's going to war. He's on mission. He's doing what God called him to do, okay? Many times we just look at all the victories David had in battles, but nobody sees the real of all the stuff he had to go through. Do you realize that David dealt with anxiety and depression all the time? Yeah, nobody talks about that. And do you know that the only thing that got David out of anxiety and depression was worship? That's why he's called the psalmist. That's why if you read the book of Psalm, all those, most of those scriptures that you see in Psalm, they're songs. And worship was the antidote for his deliverance of anxiety so that he can function every day. But how many know that it takes faith to worship God when everything is falling apart? It takes a stretch to open your mouth and start singing, Lord, I need you. Lord, I need you. Every hour, I need you. And so David is facing not one battle, battle after battle, battle after battle. He would think like, God, how many more battles do I need to fight? Come on. God said, I called you to war. When David wanted to build the temple, God said, I didn't call you to build the temple. I called you to bring the provision for my vision. That's why don't get it twisted. Not all of you are called to ministry. Most of you are not called to ministry. Most of you are called to the marketplace ministry where you're like a David. You go out and you bring the provision for God's vision. Solomon, his son, he was anointed to build the temple, not David. So David is like, darn it, I wanted to build the temple. God's like, nope. Why? His hands had too much blood. He was a man of war. So now in this story, he's, he's, he's cruising with his with his his soldiers, they weren't many, guys. He had, he had few soldiers. The Philistine armies would come anywhere from 300 to 500,000 soldiers. He'd only have like maybe 100, 150, 300 maximum. His enemies, thousands. So David is in this context of the story I'm going to get into right now. David is walking and he's seeing, he's seeing the Philistine army. This army has been causing havoc for generations. This army has defeated all of God's people generation after generation after generation. But then there was one that he anointed named David. And David had the courage to face the reality. And David is there and he's seen. He's exhausted and tired like most of us sometimes. You've been doing good for a long time. But while you're doing good, be careful you don't grow weary. Because when you grow weary while doing good, that's the enemy's foothold for your life. And then he comes for the stronghold. And then you have this stronghold of depression and anxiety. And then you park there, live there, tent there. But God says, I didn't call you to live by that. I called you to live by faith. And so David is looking at this army. And then he hears the spirit of God speak to him. And he tells David, David, go to the, go to, go to the side of the road at the mulberry tree. Can you imagine how uncomfortable that was? All of his men are seeing the enemy is coming to kill us. And you want to go ahead and park on the side of the road? Just imagine the things that David had to do. The odds that he had to go against. Come on. He felt, probably felt like a salmon going upstream. When everybody else was like, we're about to die. What are you doing? Read the Bible. There was times where his men wanted to kill him. We don't, we don't talk about those stories. When his, his men felt disappointed at David. Angry at David. Upset at David. So if you get mad at your leader, oh well. Or someone get mad at you, oh well. When you're doing something for God, you're going to be hated on. It's going to happen. That's why it's so important to have an ear to hear. So David, is, 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 he hears the voice of heaven. God tells him, go hang out by the shade at the mulberry trees. Like, Dude, we're, about, we're in the heat of fire. And you're telling me you want to give me some shade right now? Sometimes God wants to take you out of the fire and put you under some shade. Let's look at what he says. Look at this. 2 Samuel 5, verse 24 through 25. I'm almost done. Don't get tired on me. Stretch your, slap yourself again. He says, look, so God speaks to him. He's parked on the side of the road. The military is coming. We're talking. They're all, everyone's like, oh, my God. Help us, Jesus. Have you ever had that bill do that to you? That monthly bill? That rent? That mortgage? Like, oh, Jesus. Here. And it's faithful. It's, and you know it's coming. 
I'll tell you, bills are more faithful than some people. I'm not kidding you. Okay, so listen. It actually starts with listen. Listen for the sound of marching in the top of the trees. Listen for what? For the what? Sound on top of what? Okay, yeah, y'all, stay with me. I wasn't going to fall. You almost made me fall. <laughs> then, move quickly. The sound will mean that I have gone out in front of you. I will strike down the Philistine army. So David did just as the Lord had commanded him. And he struck down the Philistines. He struck them down so bad from Gibeah all the way to Jezer. What am I saying? Sometimes God is going to put you on stop. It takes faith to have an ear to hear God say, stop. You're too much on fire right now. You're too stressed. You're too worried. You got too much anxiety. Pull over. And God will put you under his shade. Stay with me. He'll put you under his shade for a minute to collect yourself. And it's interesting because faith is what creates the signs and the wonders. It's not just give me a sign, God, and give me a wonder. No, 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 no. It's have an ear to hear when he says stop so that he can show you a sign and a wonder. And so he's right there under the mulberry trees, right? Just think. All his army, while the army is literally marching down, ready to kill them all. It's not easy to be under the shadow of Almighty God when you know you're facing cancer, depression, anxiety, bills, troubles. It's not easy to take a break. Huh? The Bible says that he said, and when you hear, he says, listen to the sound on top of the trees. And what, put that verse back up real quick. Look at this. Nope. The first one, please. Verse 24. He says, then move, he says, uh, listen to the, to, the, to the sound of what? The what? The marching in the tops of the trees. It wasn't that he was listening to the marching of his enemy because they already saw the marching of the enemy. It was listen to the marching of my angels in heaven that are coming down and going before you. And when you hear my angels march, then you all already know that I've gone before you and I've already defeated that enemy. That takes a stretch to pull over and to listen. Let's be honest. We're not good listeners as the church today. We're not. Look at your neighbor and say, you're not. I have failed to listen at times. I started things that I wasn't supposed to start. It wasn't God's timing. But my passion, my zeal for God's house ate me up. You got to know when to just park and just wait for the sound of the marching on top of the trees. And when you hear the sound, then move quickly. It didn't say take your time, just, just kind of walk at it. No, he says move quickly. Now's the time. Because that window is only open for a second. You get in and you go. That's why some people get super blessed in businesses at the right time. Why? They moved quickly. <laughs> While others are still talking about it. Still talking about the mountain. Yeah, one day <laughs> when I have a lot of money. I'm going to start that business. That one day won't come. Because if you can't start when you have nothing, come on, you won't continue when you have everything. You'll get lazy, sloppy, because you, you didn't work to get there. You wanted someone to give it all to you. And it just doesn't work that way. David is looking at this overwhelming army overwhelming stress he's like oh, here we go again man i'm sure think about him trying to just 
comfort his men, like, guys, don't worry. We're going to make it out of this. We're gonna get... I mean, that gets exhausting, having to always convince someone, we're going to be okay. It gets exhausting trying to convince someone, hey, listen, you're, you're, you're good, man. Don't sweat. God's going to show up. Do you guys remember my faith definition of faith last week? Anybody remember that? Faith is being uncertain but confident at the same time. I'm not sure what the heck's going to happen now, but I'm confident that the angels of the Lord have marched before me. Woo! When you think like that, man, it just changes everything. It changes the game. Hmm. Let me give you this last point. So how do I do that? How do, I, how do I get to that, Pastor? I hear what you're saying. Okay, good. Now, what do I do? How do I stretch? You ready? You got to change the way you think. Romans 12, too quick. Don't live, don't live the way this world lives. Let your way of thinking be completely changed. Then you will be able to test what God wants for you. And you will agree that what he wants is right. His plan is good and pleasing and it's perfect. The Bible says, as a man thinks, so is he. In other words, you become what you make up. You become what you make up. In other words, if you see the worst in you, that's what comes out of you. And how many know that the thoughts are powerful? Listen, you either are letting thoughts control you or you're controlling the thoughts. But how many know that thoughts were not created to control me or control you? They were created to be controlled by us, the person, the spirit of God inside of you to say, nope, we're going to change the way we think. We're going to change the way we see that right now. Yeah, I see we're going down, <laughs> but I hear the whisper of heaven saying, you're going to make it. In other words, you become what you make up. You become what you think. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. So what do I have to do? you got to make up your mind. Are you going to keep thinking the way you think? Or are you going to get a faith lift? But you got to renew the thinking of your mind. Listen, the word is the only thing that can change the way you think. The word is the only thing that can reset how you believe. Outside of that, there is no other way. You'll just keep doing things the way you know to do them. And how many know that gets old? It gets boring after. Let me just give you an example. Let me show you some pictures. What do y'all see? Y'all see the old man? Yeah, on a horse. You see the lady laying down? Yeah, right. Okay, cool. Next picture. All right. That's a good one. How many see it? Nope. How many horses? Three horses. How many wolves? Two wolves. Do you guys see the man? Yes. Yeah, see, some of you didn't see it. Look, this is horse one, horse two, horse three. That's the mouth of the horse going. <laughs> okay, next picture. Look at this. You got Jesus there, right? Where else? What else? Do you see the horse? Right? There's so many things here. Next one. Look at this. Pretty cool, huh? See the lady? It, what, what's my point in this? Shh. What's the point of this? The point of this is that every single one of you can only see a certain piece of the puzzle. But when you first look at it, and trust me, because I've done it too, I didn't see it when I first looked at the picture and all of them. I didn't see everything right away. It took me a minute. It took me focus. It took determination. It took me taking extra time to try to look through everything and try to find every single clue that's in this picture. That's like faith. You can't, you, your, your faith, my faith is one dimensional. That's why we need other people's faith. The Bible says wherever there's two or three gathered together in my name, he says, I'll be right there with them. In other words, there are things that you can't see that I can see by faith and I can encourage you and lift you up. There are things that I can't see that you see that you can say, Pastor, we can see those $10 million we need for this new church building. 
See, some of you are already like, oh, my God, 10 minutes. See, you don't have faith right there. That's right. You're not, definitely not the person to talk to. Praise God. Yeah, we'll go, we'll go bankrupt with you. No, I'm talking about people that are like, I can see. I can see. And I've had people say, I can see. Pastor, I see our building. I see our stage. I see the thousands of people coming to Christ. I see. I'm like, ooh, I like you. Because sometimes there's moments where I don't see that. So I need to hear it. Because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. I don't need your opinion. I need to hear what God has told you. You need to hear what God has told me. And when we all together collectively as a church, as we operate and elevate our faith, guess what? The first time we see the picture, we saw it all. So what am I saying? You can't see everything. But the right people at the right place, at the right time, you can see it all. You can't do it alone. I'm going to close this now because you all know. You're, is he done yet? Yes, I'm done. Three times, three times Jesus said, be of good cheer. Be of good cheer. Be of good cheer. In John 16, 33, he said, be of good cheer. He said, for in this world you will have many tribulations, but be of good cheer, for I have overcome them. You know what that tells me? That God overcoming every tribulation tells me then I can overcome mine too. He looked at the paralytic man. He said, hey, in Matthew chapter 4, he said, hey, paralytic, I am he. I am the one. Your sins are forgiven. Be of good cheer. Instead of just being thankful for what you have, how about let's start being thankful for the things God has taken away from us. He took our sin. He took our shame. He took our guilt. He took the condemnation, and he nailed it once on the cross. We can thank God for that. We can be cheerful about it. Man, we are forgiven. <laughs> Glory to Jesus. I don't have to live in this guilt anymore. I don't have to live in shame anymore. Amen? Like, wow. Be a good cheer. You look all throughout the Bible. When the disciples were out in the, in, 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 on the sea and and they were afraid. And, and he said, hey, be a good cheer. Don't be afraid. It's moi. It's me, man. It's, G I mean, it's me. That's what we need to remember. When you're in the storm, be of good cheer. God is with you. Close your eyes. Bow your heads, please. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much that there is a faith lift happening in every heart here. Our eyes will gaze on you, Jesus. We pray that you would help us all, Father, to stretch our faith, to believe you, to trust your word. Lord, you said in Hebrews eleven six, 6, but without faith, it's impossible to please God. For he who comes to God must believe that he is God and he's the reward of those who diligently seek him. Lord, today, we have diligently seek you. We sought you out today, God. We came to church. We're in your house. We love your house. We love your word. We believe in your word. So thank you, Father, for stirring our hearts to believe and to see differently. And though we live in this world, thank you that we're not of it. We're only passing by. With that said, if you're here and you've never have invited Jesus Christ into your heart, you've never invited God into your life, this is your opportunity. Listen, the only way to eternity, the only way to heaven is through his son, Jesus. God made it very clear. There's no other way to heaven. Don't believe the lie. All roads lead to heaven. No, no, they don't. All roads do not lead to heaven. Only one does. His name is Jesus. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one goes to the Father except through me. That's like someone telling you, hey, every road in Santa Clarita leads to your house. No, it doesn't, Goofy. You're crazy. All roads don't lead to my house. God says there's only one way into eternity, and that's through my son, Jesus, the one who died for you on the cross, who paid for your sins, and who gave you eternal life. But that only comes, he says, if you confess with your mouth and you believe with your heart, you shall be saved. 
If you're here and you're saying, Pastor, I've never done that personally. I've known about God. I've heard about God, but I've never done it personally. When I count to three, you're going to lift your hand up high in the air. And we're going to pray. You know why? Because you're going to stretch. You're going to stretch that hand. You're going to say, God, save me. Why? I'm not asking you to respond to me. I'm asking you to respond to God. He loves you. He wants to heal you. He wants to forgive you of your sins. At the count of three, are you ready? Don't be afraid. Stretch. One, he loves you. Two, this is not embarrassing. No, this is awesome. Think about it. When you die, you'll be in heaven forever. Your life is short. Heaven is forever. Eternity is forever. And God made a way for us to spend eternity with him and not in darkness. Ready? Three, if that's you, lift your hand high quickly, quickly. Lift your hand up high. I see that hand. Anyone else? I see that. Thank you. Anyone else? Don't be embarrassed. This is your moment right now. Quickly. I have to go. All right. Let's pray together, everybody. Jesus, thank you so much for saving me and for loving me the way you have this day. Today I receive you as my Lord and Savior. Thank you so much for forgiving me of all my sins. Today, I'm born again, filled with your Holy Spirit, filled with life and victory in Christ Jesus. Thank you so much for not giving up on me and for loving me the way you did this day. In Jesus' name, amen. If today's message impacted you in any way and you want to help us spread the gospel with a financial gift, text the number below. And we know that someone's life will be changed the same way that yours was today.